Well, welcome, Mr. President, to Lagos, Nigeria, home to perhaps Africa's biggest youth population. I'm Maupe Ogun for Channels Television here. And here with me in the studio are a selection of some of Nigeria's brightest and best. And I must tell you, Mr. President, they're mostly women, so you yeah, better be careful around them. <laughs> uh, and they, they say they're on the march, and they have their question ready. Over now to you, Aisha. Good afternoon, Mr. President. My name is Aisha Maina, and I represent seven other people here. In acknowledging our challenges and our responsibility as the young leaders of Nigeria to accept our challenges and make the difference, we would like to thank you for your support to Nigeria and Africa as a whole. The largest resource in Nigeria is our human capital, and we would like to ask a two-pronged question. The first is, how can the United States deepen its investment in deploying technology that would develop our vast human capital as well as the education of her youth? My second question is two-pronged. Sorry, Mr. President. Considering how long the war on terror has been on for, would you say that we are winning the war on terror, seeing that there are new terrorist groups developing in Africa, one of which is in Nigeria. Thank you. Well, those are both great questions. Thank you. And, and uh, before I answer the question, I just want to be clear. I am surrounded by opinionated women in my house all day long. So I've got good practice dealing, <laughs> dealing with strong women. Yeah, you, you guys haven't met Michelle, but you've probably seen her on TV. She's not shy. And, and Malia and Sasha, they're just taken right up after, after her. So every night at dinner, I'm surrounded. Um, in, terms of, in terms of human capital and young people, uh, I think there is no doubt that the most important investment any country can make, not just an African country, any country can make is educating its youth and providing them the skills they need to compete in a highly technological, advanced world economy. Countries that do not do that well will not succeed. Countries that excel at training their young people are going to succeed because these days businesses can go anywhere. And one of the key criteria for any business is where can I find outstanding workers? Where can I find outstanding uh, people to manage a plant or manage my sales force? And if you have countries with high illiteracy rates or limited skills, you're going to have problems. And, and I want to be clear that this is a problem in the United States, not just a problem in Africa. One of the main things that I'm spending a lot of time on is trying to push Congress to improve our early childhood education because it turns out that children are, are most susceptible to learning between the ages of zero and three. And so working with uh, parents, particularly mothers, uh, around reading to their children, proper nutrition, you know, stimulating activities, then when they get to school, making sure that our schools are prepared and redesigned for today, because a lot of the schools in the United States were first created during the agricultural era and, and aren't always appropriate for what's required today. Uh, and then on into what we call community colleges, which are two-year colleges or four-year colleges and universities. Uh, somebody should have told my helicopter to quiet down while I'm talking. Yeah. So across the board, we're having to rethink education and workforce training. Uh, and one of the things that we want to do is to partner with a country like Nigeria uh, and identify ways that we can provide direct value added, whether it's in helping to train teachers, helping to uh, incorporate technologies into uh, the education process. So for example, one of the things that you hear uh, uh, across the continent is because uh, a lot of Africans still live in rural areas, 
it may be difficult for them to access uh, education and schooling once they get beyond a certain level. Well, are there ways in which we can pipe in, essentially, a university uh, into a rural community? And suddenly you've got the lecturer right there uh, without the same costs or obligation for a young person to uh, take on uh, when they go to uh, you know, travel far away from home uh, in order to study. Uh, and so I think that there's some excellent ideas that sometimes we're doing country by country, depending on the country plan. Uh, but this is an area where I would love to get more input from young people in terms of what they think would work. Uh, and so part of the uh, Young African Leaders Initiative may be to uh, elicit additional ideas from those, particularly those who may be working in education and have a sense of what are the barriers right now for young people uh, in order to, uh, to succeed. Now, with, with, res with respect to the, the so-called war on terror, uh, there's no doubt that we've made some progress in dealing with some extremist groups. For example, core al-Qaeda and bin Laden uh, that was based in the Fatah area uh, between Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, that they have been greatly diminished. Um, but what is also true is that in some ways the problem has metastasized. You have more regional uh, terrorist organizations like a Boko Haram in Nigeria espousing an extremist ideology, showing no regard for human life, and you know, although they may not have the same transnational capacity that some of the early organizations did, they're doing great harm in Africa and in the Middle East and in South Asia. You know, people always talk about uh, the, the terrorist threat to the United States or the West, but the truth of the matter is, is that the number of people who are killed by terrorist attacks in African countries or in Muslim countries, or in South Asia, far outstrips any deaths that are experienced by Westerners. It's typically people right there where these organizations are based that are more, most likely to be killed. When the, when the Kenya embassy bombing happened, the overwhelming majority of people who were killed were Kenyans, not Americans. And so this is not just a problem for us, this is a problem for everybody. Now the question is, you know, how do we address this, uh, this problem? It is my strong belief that terrorism is more likely to emerge and take root where countries uh, are not delivering for their people. And where there are sources of conflict and underlying uh, frustrations that have not been adequately dealt with. The danger we have right now, for example, in a place like Somalia, is that it's been two generations, maybe three, since there was a functioning government inside of Somalia. Now, we start to see, actually, some progress, in part because of intervention by African nations in Somalia to clear the space, to create the space for governance. Uh, but, you know, you look at what's happening in Mali, for example, right now, part of the problem is, is that you had a weak central government and democratic institutions that weren't reaching out as far into uh, the country as, as were necessary. And, and we've got to build those institutions. A lot of what we talked about in terms of responsiveness and governance and democracy, those things become uh, defense mechanisms against terrorism. They're the most important defense against terrorism. So I don't start with the attitude of uh, a military solution to these problems. I think the more that we're giving people opportunity, the more that we're giving people education, the more that we're helping resolve conflicts through regular democratic processes, the less likely they are to take root. Now, having said that, there are some extremist groups 
that will not compromise or work through a democratic process. And we have to also be realistic about that. And what we want to do is partner with African countries to figure out how we can help. But I promise this notion somehow that uh, we want to somehow expand our military reach. I was elected to end a war. I've ended one. I'm now in the process of ending another one. Every few weeks, I go and visit soldiers who are your age, who've had their legs blown off in Afghanistan, or worse. Every week, I'm writing letters to the families of fallen soldiers. Sometimes I go uh, to Arlington National Cemetery where our heroes are buried. And I hug those family and I, I feel their sobs on my shoulder. And we, we, th this idea is somehow that, you know, we, we want to get more involved militarily around the world is simply not true. First of all, it costs a lot of money. And the United States, just like every country around the world, has to think about its budget. And where, where we intervene, oftentimes it's not very effective because unless you've got a, a local population that is standing up against terrorism, we end up being viewed as interlopers and intruders. So with, in the Africa context, what we want to do is to build African capacity. You know, we want the African Union and other regional organizations to build up the capacity to send in peacekeepers, to be able to uh, nip terrorist cells that may be forming before they start and, and gain strength. And we can provide advice and training uh, and in some cases equipment, but we would love nothing more than for Africa collectively to say no to extremism, say no to terrorism, to say no to sectarianism, which in the case of Boko Haram, for example, is an example of uh, essentially a re religious rationale for this kind of violence. And the United States to be able to step back and worry about selling iPads and planes. That's what we, that's what we would like to do. But what we won't do is just stand by if uh, our embassy is being attacked or our people are in vulnerable situations. And, and we expect countries to work with us uh, to try to deal with some of these threats. Uh, and there's a, there's a global issue. It's not just one uh, related to the United States. Okay.